as an archaeologist, you have to think outside the box. Yes. Because, because, because they're, they're, they're used to thinking, okay, I'm digging until I get to the foundations of a structure. Yes. Mission accomplished. Yes. But in order to find what you're looking for, you have to go beyond that. Yeah. And then when they said, this is not archaeology. Yeah, it is archaeology. This is, <laughs> this is the property of Israel. That's their heritage. That's their property. Mm-hmm. You got to go down. If you, how are you going to find it? Archaeologists, they all come there and they're all digging. They go, oh, virgin soul, got to stop. Right. You can't do that. You got to go down below that because you got to follow the instructions. Mm-hmm. What men normally do, don't follow the instructions. <laughs> right. They got to do on this one. Right. You got to go to the depths and you got to look in the places because every single place on the Copper Scroll, the way it's described, you can find a match at Qumran. Mm. All right, today we have on our show, the Temple Mount Report, a special guest, Mr. Jim Barfield, all the way from the U.S., who is, um, actually, you have a book that has just been released very recently called The Copper Scroll Project. And we're very excited to learn about what is the Copper Scroll, first of all. If you're me, for example, I have no clue what you're talking about. I know about, you know, Jerusalem, history, Bible, basic stuff like that, but then you come in with this copper scroll, you know, we know the Qumran cave uh, findings of the prophets or all these different, you know, things that are well known to people. Mm-hmm. But the first time I ever heard the copper scroll, I had no clue what on earth people are talking about, what it is. And it turns out you have a very um, personal connection in the development of this finding. And uh, we're here to find out what is the copper scroll? What's its significance and um, the work that you spent many years, I believe, uh, working on this particular uh, document that is actually very important for our day today? Yeah, actually, a, a matter of fact, I made the discovery how to understand the Copper Scroll, and I'll explain to you what it is in just a second. Right. I, I made the discovery, it was during Hanukkah, it was 2006, exactly 12 years ago. So this is, a, this is an important anniversary for us, and I'm so excited to be here with you guys to be able to share it with you. The Copper Scroll was found in 1952. Mm-hmm. It's, it looks like two scrolls, but it's really not. It's one. What happened was they hammered out some copper. They made it about uh, seven feet long, three sections, seven feet long and about one foot wide. And they began, five men, began to tap with a um, stylus and, a, and a, I'm assuming a hammer, maybe a little rock, who knows, but they tapped the Hebrew letters. And what they did is they took the uh, sheets and they started backwards. Like in, in English, we write from, from left to right. Mm-hmm. And they had to write backwards from right to left when normally they had, you know, you know that you, in Hebrew, they write from right to right left. Right to left? Yeah. So they were typing it out left to right. Yeah, only in back, and backwards they'd write everything. And you'll see on the Copper Scroll, if you take a good look at it, there were a couple of times they typed the letters in or tapped the letters in and they wrote them in backwards. Uh-huh. Because they had to remember, as they were describing mm-hmm. important locations, 57 locations, what I count, mm-hmm. 57 locations that hide enormous amounts of gold, silver, gems, uh, uh, vessels, kalim, and they, they did that for future generations. That's why they put it in copper, right. so that that copper scroll would last a long time. Very similar to the story in Jeremiah, chapter 32, where they write out uh, the deed or the paperwork for land. All right, so let's back up a little bit. So you're not of the team that found the scrolls, because yeah. that's... Way before, before you, that was even before you were born. Before I was born. But it's in very uh, close proximity of the original uh, finding of the scrolls by the little uh, yes. shepherd kid, you know, that was shepherding the his Bedouin flocks, boy. the Bedouin boy, and yep. the finding of these uh, scrolls, as you're explaining the difference, right? So you have the, the, the scrolls of, of the scriptures that were found in, in, uh, in, in clay pots. Exactly. But this particular scroll is found a few years later, obviously, because they started to dig around there, trying to figure out what else is hidden in these caves. And they come upon scrolls that are um, written 
on uh, sheets of copper. And I can explain in a very whatever detail that, that, that's different than the normal and all that. But how did you get involved with this project? How did you hear about this? And how come, for example, I haven't even heard of the Copper Scroll before you actually made it uh, more public? Because I think it's actually through your research and uh, your work that it's become public, because I know here in Israel, I never heard of the Copper Scrolls. I'm a very, uh, Bible study is my thing. I love to study scripture. Uh, being a firefighter years ago, whenever I'd get off duty, we had all night long to yeah. study because I was there for 24 hours. Weekends, I had all weekend long to study for. Right, the 24 hour shift. Yeah, it was great. Right, right. And, uh, they do that, the same here, by the way. Yeah, yes, yeah, I know some of the guys, firefighters from here. So what I did was I, I took my Bible study and I took it to another level because I knew that the Dead Sea Scrolls are very important uh, to you, to me, and they are. People don't know that, but those, those mm -hmm. guys at Qumran, the guys that wrote it, and I know they're, they're the ones that wrote it, mm -hmm. uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, they've got all kinds of information in there that is very important to us. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what I was doing. I was comparing notes from Scripture to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I read the Copper Scroll years ago. How? I mean, how did, come, how did you come by, uh, come by the information? Well, the, the information, there was a guy by the name of Martinez. Mm -hmm. He did a translation of all the scrolls, and I used his translation, okay. and, I, and I read it. Uh, and then I found a facsimile of the Copper Scroll, and I compared it, and I began to study it. And a guy named Bendel Jones. So then you started to get interested. It piqued your curiosity as you were looking at the... Yeah, it, 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 because with this guy, Vendor Jones, I was talking to, he had been reading the, uh, the Copper Scroll for years. He'd been trying to find the treasures of the Copper Scroll because it's what it is. It's a verbal treasure map. Mm -hmm. He had been trying to find the treasures for years. So it's not scripture like no. the other no. findings at Kumla. No, not at all, but it is incredibly written important. By. Written by five men. Mm -hmm. Bindle taught me this. The day that I was spending, well, the weekend I spent a weekend with him, he taught me that five men wrote it. And it was, he's the one that got me interested in it because before I wanted scripture, I didn't want a treasure map. <laughs> and he told me, he said, Jimmy, this is, this is prophecy. And he, and he piqued my interest. Mm -hmm. I was an investigator. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was an investigator of the year for Oklahoma and international investigator of the year. Mm -hmm. So I took my, what I learned, and actually I learned how to do investigations from my Bible study. Mm -hmm. Take that for what it's worth, but that's how I learned <laughs> right. to do investigations. Yeah. And that's how I won these nice awards is because I applied the same techniques. Mm -hmm. Well, I began to study it, and uh, Vindel, I went home, had my grandkids with me, and, and my wife, and my son and his wife, we, all, we go back home. I was, my interest was sky high. So December, like I said, it was during Hanukkah. Mm -hmm. It was a cold day. I got up, got my coffee. It's five o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> oh gosh. Sat in my little study room and I and I got a, a copy of the uh, the uh, Copper Scroll mm -hmm. in English and I began to read it and it said under the ruins in the Valley of Accor and I followed the instructions and my wife laughs about that to this day because I never follow instructions. Right. <laughs> under the ruins in the Valley of Accor and I thought well the only ruins that I'm familiar with is Qumran. Mm -hmm. So I get a map of Qumran. I just happened to have a map of it laying there, and I pulled it over and I started looking at it. And it said, at the steps extending east, 40 cubits, 17 talents of silver vessels. And I, silver vessels? And I thought, I'm thinking temple vessels at that point. Mm -hmm. And I was right. So I pulled the map over, and I looked at it, and there's only one set of runs, uh, set of steps at Qumran that head east. So I got out the measurements. I did the math, and... And it was exactly 40 cubits. And I thought, gee, man, hey, it's a coincidence. Had right. to be a coincidence. That, that's one coincidence, right? Yeah. <laughs> Within five minutes, I had the first four figured out, three figured out. And then within uh, 20 minutes, I had the first five locations figured out. And I'm going, okay, wait a minute. I literally, I put my head on my desk and I thought, Oh my gosh, if I this figured this out. It was a little too bizarre. Yeah, it was way bizarre because they, uh, literally every one of the ones that I looked at Qumran, they matched. Mm. And I wouldn't be so cocky about it. And I'm really not cocky, I'm just confident. Mm. But I took it to the Antiquities Authority, Shuka Dorfman, the Antiquities Authority. He thought I was a nut. And within five minutes, literally five minutes, he was on the phone calling. Uh, Yitzhak Mog and Yuval Peleg, the guys over Qumran, head of Qumran, mm -hmm. and had them meet us 
Tuesday morning, was a, just before Shabbat, I was here in Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and he had to meet us at his uh, office in, uh, at the uh, Rockefeller Museum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, he's called in the two top guys to come talk to a fireman from right. Oklahoma about one of the most valuable treasures in history. Mm -hmm. And they show up. Yitzhak Magan is not happy because there's this fireman telling him how to look, <laughs> what to look for. And I, I'm not <laughs> telling him. I'm just showing him, look, here's what I found. Yeah. Yuval Peleg, on the other hand, a younger man, wonderful guy. He was the archaeologist over Qumran. He's standing up, and I've got a picture of it. He's standing up looking at it with uh, Shuka Dorfman, the head of the Antiquities Authority, the secretary, Yitzhak Magan, and me. And I put, my, I put my research in the middle of the desk or table, and I told Chris, my buddy, I said, take a picture of us all here with my research open so that they could see. So in the future, I could show it to guys like you mm -hmm. to prove that this really happened. Right. And they... Because it sounds like a great tale. Oh, it, well, yeah. <laughs> like and, one of those fishing trips. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, he's, he's sitting there, and they're, they're, they're speaking in Hebrew. And guys, I don't speak Hebrew. Mm -hmm. And they were talking in Hebrew, but I was smart enough as an investigator that I had a tape recorder. And I had it running to record the conversation, not to be sneaky, or, mm -hmm. but I wanted to remember everything that was said, especially if they were talking in Hebrew. I want to go back and be able to review and understand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, this really nice rabbi that I know was waiting on me. <laughs> he was waiting for the results because he had already seen my research, and he was in love with it. Mm -hmm. So I go back. He listens to it, and he's got the headphones on. And he's, he says, oh, my gosh. He takes the headphones off. He stops the recording. He said, they think you've done it. I said, what? Because they didn't say that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. He said, they think you've done it. And he put them back on, and he's, he's, he takes off again. He said, oh, my gosh, they do. They believe you figured out this copper scroll, <laughs> and, uh, which was really exciting for that's, me. That's pretty huge because these guys don't just jump yeah. the gun, I yeah. imagine. You know, they don't normally, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, that's nice. We'll go examine this. We'll get back to you in a few years type thing. So just the mm -hmm. fact that, that what you had shown them had already proven so much, yeah. that actually speaks volumes, I would say. Yeah, Shelly Neese, the lady that wrote our book, she was just talking about, mm -hmm. it's all in the book. And she did a great job telling the story. And we, we don't, I don't release any of the information about the locations of the gold. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start releasing the information now. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a perfect time. That your, your temple conference is coming up in a couple of days or a few days. Mm -hmm. And this is where, this is a perfect venue for me to be able to release this information. I want the during Israelis. During Hanukkah as well. During Hanukkah 12, on our 12-year anniversary. Which, which, by the way, is significant for us. We chose Hanukkah uh, not because of high season. Mm -hmm. we're, we're missing out on a lot of our Christian guests that we're right. trying to impact. They won't be here. They're here during Sukkot. They're here during all the other uh, in fact, exactly. many of them have, yeah. or, have already just left. And this yeah. is the dead season for, for us here in Israel. But for us, it's significant because our cause is the temple, and it's the battle for the sanctity of the name of God. Mm -hmm. Because really, that's what it's about. It's not about, a lot of people get confused with, you know, the temple structure, whatever, third temple, all this stuff. Really, it's about the sanctity of the name of God. Mm -hmm. And we're fighting for His holy mountain, His holy space that He has set aside from all places on the earth. And that was the battle in the struggle of the Maccabees. That's what they fought for, the sanctity, the Torah of Israel, etc. And so really that's the significance why we said we have to do it on, on, uh, on uh, Hanukkah, no, knowing, knowing nothing about your, your discoveries and how that matches up. And I just think that's pretty neat how that all comes together. And what's really neat to me is I'm here not to reach the Americans. <laughs> I love them. They're my family, but I'm not here for them. I'm right. here for Israel. I'm here for the temple, and I'm here ultimately for God, mm. because this belongs to Him, yeah. and and ultimately, and it, and it belongs to the Israelis, mm. and no other nation, no other country, no other religion. This is for Israel, mm. and these things are for Israel, and it's like the rabbi said, it's the dowry for the coming yeah. bride. Yeah. Well, Hanukkah. You know, it's all about restoring the temple, all about uh, the gold and silver, even the little candy things or the coins with wrapped in that's gold right, and silver tinfoil. Right, that's right. And that's <laughs> what this is about. Yeah. 
And in 2 Maccabees, that's the one that, that is, is really interesting because 2 Maccabees talks about Jeremiah taking the Ark of the Covenant, the uh, tabernacle, and all of the implements that go with the tabernacle except for the uh, menorah. It's not named on there. And he says he took these things and he buried them, took them on the way to Mount Nebo. And people think he went to Mount Nebo. Uh, if you read it, it says... Uh, Thenceforth, uh, he was on his way, and he took him and he buried him. Now, Qumran is just a little bit out of the way on the way to Mount Nebo. Mm -hmm. Go a little ways out of the way, and depending on which route you take, you take these implements and you bury them inside of a cave, and, and I absolutely believe we, we've determined where that cave is at. Mm -hmm. Because on the Copper Scroll, the first three locations were in a perfectly straight line, and they stop at the cave. Mm -hmm. The last five locations on the Copper Scroll or in a perfectly straight line, ascending up the hill, and they stop at the cave. Hmm. And if you draw a straight line, the two converge right there over the top of this cave. It's crazy. So Hanukkah, your uh, temple conference, perfect venue for me to come over and tell the Israelis, please listen. Hmm. I've already, the Antiquities Authority has already done an excavation in 2009 Mm -hmm. based on my research, but all of a sudden as we were starting, very, just got started, mm -hmm. you all said, well, let's go down. I told, he asked me, how deep do you want to go? I said, I want to go uh, at least six feet, two meters. Mm -hmm. He said, yeah, we can do that. After the phone call, everything stopped. We went three feet and you've all standing in the, in the he's, he's, he's my tight. Yeah. He's standing in the ditch and he says, uh, this is two meters. Well, half of his body is sticking out of the cave, yeah. uh, out of the dig. I said, you've all, this is not two meters. He said, yeah, this is two meters. Yeah, and it's and I, two meters. <laughs> yeah, it's really two meters. And I said, okay, you mean, this, is, this is your background. This is your playground, and I'm playing in it. Mm -hmm. So we stopped. I mean, we did a couple of little digs. Little, We dug 11 inches, and went, you can't find this stuff at 11 sure. inches. Sure. This I mean, is incredible. You're talking about, uh, was it close to 2,000 years of buildup of debris and so on and time yeah. going by? So yeah, it's that's a lot of time. I mean, the whole city of David, for example, okay, buried. was completely buried exactly. in time, like a time capsule. Yeah. So Qumran, same way. Even that tallest tower uh, there, uh, it was it was almost completely buried. Just a little bit of it sticking out of the ground. Well, they excavated, and they and ex the archaeologists go down to uh, virgin soil and they stop. Hmm. Well, Yitzhak Magen was sitting over. Remember the meeting I had with. Uh, those two archaeologists and Shukadorf and the head of the antiquities, they're sitting there and he says, Mr. Barfield, they, they can't be there. We've gone, we've dug down to virgin soil, but there's nothing there. I said, that's the point. Right. I said, you went to virgin you soil, to you've got to go another seven cubits, 12 feet, or three meters, four meters, and you've got to go down that deep to be able to find these things. And you've all, who the younger man is going, oh, that's right. You know, like you have to, in other words, as an archaeologist, you have to think outside the box. Yes, because 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 they're 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 used to thinking, okay, I'm digging until I get to the foundations of a structure. Yes, mission accomplished. Yes, but in order to find what you're looking for, you have to go beyond that. Yeah, and then well, they said this is not archaeology. Yeah, it is archaeology. <laughs> this is this is the property of Israel. That's their heritage. That's their property. Mm -hmm. You got to go down if you. How are you going to find it? Archaeologists, they all come there and they're all digging. They go, oh, bird your soul, got to stop. Right. You can't do that. You got to go down below that because you got to follow the instructions. Mm -hmm. What men normally do, don't follow the instructions. <laughs> right. They got to do on this one. Right. You got to go to the depths and you got to look in the places because every single place on the Copper Scroll, the way it's described, you can find a match at Qumran. Mm -hmm. Every one of them. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the biggest challenges here in Israel when it comes to archaeology it comes to building in general. Okay, let's say I want to put up a skyscraper exactly. or a small neighborhood, you yeah. know, just some small buildings or a house. Anything in the city of Jerusalem or any other yes. city in, in the country of Israel that has an ancient past, the minute I break ground, right, and if I hit anything archaeologically important, that's it. it. Stop. Everything stops. Everything's... There's people in the world don't think I think they don't understand the, the challenges mm -hmm. and the hurdles that you need to overcome in order to get to your objective. Oh, gosh. <laughs> and plus, yeah. I happen to work for the Israeli government for a few years and I can tell you uh, it's not a perfect system. OK, you have a democracy here. You, you have um, uh, a lot of good things, but 
uh, and like in any government body, mm -hmm. okay, things take time. There's lots of red tape, lots of red tape, etc. But but this adds a whole other uh, layer when it comes to the archaeology mm -hmm. problem, the antiquities problem, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, you're 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 trying to get through so many different bodies, the nature reserve, the you name right. it. Yeah, and they've got, they've got legitimate concerns. Yes. And then another legitimate concern, because I absolutely love Qumran. I mean, even I, I really love Masada too, but it's magnificent. But this is, this is the, the past and it's our future. Mm -hmm. Because I, listen to me, Qumran was the home of the prophets. Mm -hmm. Write it down, get it ready, because when the time comes and Messiah is here and he says, oh, by the way, Qumran, that's an important spot out there. <laughs> right. And if you own any land out there by Qumran, you better get ready because if they're right, mm -hmm. if I'm right, right, and that stuff is there, they had better do the best document. And it can't be a, a regular archaeological dig. Sure. You've got to document everything because if I'm right and that cave is there, they sealed it. We tested the, the mortar that we found out there. And two places, this Skokie, the, Illinois. One of the over 50 locations. Yeah, that, it's the last, lo third location and the last location. Mm. We found mortar there. So we took a sample of that mortar, sent it off to get it tested and had an Israeli come and look at it who was an expert on uh, ancient mortar. And he said, yeah, he said, yeah. He said, every indication is this is man-made. Right. And the Skokie, Illinois, they did a scientific evaluation. It cost me a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. It, this is definitely more, uh, more likely as man-made, and they gave a lot of scientific reasons that were way over my head. Sure. And so there, at that location, if, let's say that it really is sealed. Mm -hmm. It's mortared, it's plastered over, mm -hmm. and we open that for the first time. If the, the earthquakes out there hadn't shifted anything, mm -hmm. that thing's been sealed up. Uh, and whoever walked in there, if it was uh, Zechariah and Haggai, their footprints could likely be in the dust in there oh, to this sure. day. Think about that. And we're, we look inside of this cave and we see stacks of gold and silver and all the, it, that's not what's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, we got to build the temple, all this good stuff. Mm -hmm. What's important is there's going to be other scrolls in there. No right. doubt about it. Right. Maybe even Jeremiah chapter 32, it talks about a title deed to the land of Benjamin. Right. Now, what if he did put that inside of there? There's two documents, one sealed, one open. What if it's in there? And what if that land of Benjamin, because where was the temple? It was in Judah, Issachar, which right. tribal property was it? You're Israeli, which was it? Benjamin, I think. Benjamin. Yeah. All of this is taking place in the land of Benjamin. The caves at Qumran, Benjamin. Qumran itself, Benjamin. All of that area is the land of Benjamin. If you don't believe me, as you're driving down to Qumran next time, there's a big sign that says, Land, land of, Benjamin. of Benjamin. Correct. Uh, which is new, by the way. Uh, it, yeah, it wouldn't be 2,000 years old, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. We just started to put up those signs, which I'm actually very thankful for. I am too. Because now you know if you're entering Samaria, you're entering the land of Benjamin and so on. It, awesome. it, it just gives you that feeling of you're in the land of the Bible. That's right. So, yeah, that's pretty neat. It is. And, and there's so many things that, uh, at Qumran. The, the Dead Sea Scrolls are revealing information uh, that is just priceless. Mm. And that's what we want to do. We're trying. The Israelis, I mean, I didn't have to do anything. In order to, like we were saying, there's so much red tape. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to do anything. I went to, when I showed this to uh, Yuval Peleg and at that round table meeting we had with the head of the Antiquities Authority, here's a fireman from Oklahoma sitting there telling them, hey, here's the possibilities. Mm -hmm. They, I called Yuval up. I came into town. It was during Pesach, uh, Passover. Mm -hmm. Came in during Passover uh, about six months later and I said, Yuval, I said, how would you like to be the uh, lead archaeologist on this whenever we go out there? And he said, I'd love to. Oh, of course. Yeah, and it, it would make it would make him uh, it would be the the, the find of oh, his career uh, find of this of anybody's career in the country. <laughs> yeah, and so he he said of course, and and uh, he believed that he believed in me. Mm. So we go, and you know what? I had to, all the paperwork I had to fill out. I mean, normally they're stacked this high and literally that high. You got to fill out to do a, a excavation, especially at Qumran. Sure, I didn't do anything. 
He said, I'll take care of it. He provided the diggers. He provided the tools. He provided everything. And we go to Qumran based on this fireman's research mm. and we start digging, but that's the one they stopped us. Now, why did they stop us? Mm. Because of all the things, I mean, who's going to want this, these things when they come out of the ground? Right. So we should gold and silver. The Egyptians are going to say, well, remember when the Exodus, so we gave you all that gold and silver, we want it back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Too bad. Right. The, uh, Palestinian, the Palestinians are going to want it. Sure. The, the Jordan, Jordanians are going to want it. Sure. And Benjamin Jones said something really, really, really interesting. He said, yeah, tell them we'll give him everything that's written in Arabic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Yeah, and you, you can have it. Take it home with you. I agree with that. But everything in Israeli or uh, in uh, Hebrew, mm -hmm. that belongs to Israel. Yep. All the implements with uh, Hebrew writing on them and all the implements in there that stacked it, uh, documented by the paperwork that's inside the cave belong to Israel. Well, on the cover scroll, it starts, it starts, begins with and explains that on the north end of the community, there is a mikvah, or a pool is what they call it, but they also called it a uh, pool of oblation or a mikvah. And at this pool, they said, when you enter in, you enter into the pool. Now look at the pool while I'm talking here. Yep. When you enter in, you have to go down and to the left. Now I'm just gonna be the, the guy who's gonna, you know. Devil's advocate. Devil's advocate, as you yep. say in English. Is that, is the community not continue over here to the north? I mean, I know we're to the north no. end, but isn't it more? No. No, the only thing else to the north, or actually north, north is here. North is that way, exactly. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, any only thing else to the north is more desert. The more desert. So yeah. we are on the very edge of the community. There's nothing more than this. Nothing else here. And we haven't found this, <coughs> in, this in the uh, This is the extreme north end of the community. Uh, the very edge of the, the community. community that's been found. So that we I, know from the archaeology, we're on the very edge of the community. North edge of the community. Yep. Yeah. All right, good. Now it says you enter, you go down and to the left, you mikvah, and according to this sign behind me here, they recognize it as a mikvah, and they recognize that there was mikvahs done here. They would cross and they would go over into the what is called on the copper scroll uh, the peristyle, Hagado, yeah. big peristyle, right. and that's exactly what this the courtyard was at the time uh, that the Essenes existed there. And I believe most of the scholars think, and I am not a scholar. Most of the college scholars think that this was a uh, uh, the Copper Scroll is talking about the second, um, second Temple period. I don't. I absolutely believe it's at the time of Jeremiah, First Temple period. So when they would come in, they'd mikvah, and they would go out and they'd face east and they would pray. I mean, you can read that in Josephus. Josephus talks about it quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. But this pool has so many details. It's a, whenever I was an investigator, we'd lift a fingerprint. Right. Right. The fingerprints have to match. This one, this is a location when Schuka Dorfman looked at my research, the Director General for the Antiquities Authority, Yuval Peleg, <clears throat> some very high-ranking rabbis, they all would just slap their foreheads and say, oh my gosh, this is In so words, simple. In other words, it's so obvious. It's obvious. It's so obvious, yeah. yeah. In other words, they didn't have to go do any deep research no. or really break their heads no. on how does this fit. No. It was, like we said earlier, by you using your investigative skills mm -hmm. with the copper scroll and then bringing all that research to them. You, d you did the hard work for them really, right? Of it figuring out, so to speak. And then once they saw yeah. that, it was like, it was so obvious. Yeah. It was just so obvious. It, it matched, because that's the other thing with evidence, all of it has to match, right? It all you has can, to match. You can have some, yeah. was it circumstantial evidence mm -hmm. you call right? And then if you don't have the rest to complete the case, you have no case. It goes out the courtroom, right? They toss you out. Yeah. But in this case. It's, it's so much evidence here. The fingerprints match so well. There's so many people, like the documents that speak about the Copper Scroll yep. from different centuries, different times in history. They talk yep. about it. They tell what's here, yep. gold, silver, and, and even some very important uh, religious artifacts. Yep. If in fact they're correct, we're we're standing on a very important spot. And to me, Qumran is a holy place. Sure. And I believe that it is a holy place to this to this day. And the 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 hardest thing to get people to understand is the Copper Scroll was not some mystical 
document. Right. It's simple, straightforward. And my, my wife la laughs at me every time I tell this story <laughs> but because she would always gripe at me for not following the instructions. Right. You know, Jimmy, why don't you follow the instructions yeah. on this and put the, yeah. the, the swing set together the right. way they tell right. you? Right. No, I didn't want yeah. to do that. Yeah. Well, you're, I followed the good, instructions. You're a good old Southern boy, just tosses the book. I don't need like, this. I know how to do this. We'll redneck it, you know, no big deal. And I think and the then you always got, end up with a whole pile of, you know, bolts loose, left bolts over. <laughs> well, there are no bolts left over on this one because sure. what I did was the, the first, the instructions were really simple mm -hmm. under the ruins. So I found the set of ruins that I knew the best, which was Qumran. Yeah. In the Valley of Accor, we are in the Valley of Accor right now. So I started with the ruins that I knew very well. Yeah. Uh, luckily, I'd been studying them for years with no interest in the Copper Scroll because it was a laundry list of, you know, kosher metal. Yeah. And that's it, you just follow the instructions, and it leads you right to this spot, and then you begin to find point by point by point by point. Yeah. That this is what I believe with without all my heart any, is the location. Any, without any loose ends. No loose ends. Yeah. Because that's what I find is very significant with your research. Um, see, a lot of things that I'll hear that's a new thing and all that, um, coming from the security world, we're skeptics. Mm -hmm. I'm not a researcher or, or, or investigator like you. I'm more of the uh, needing to read through the BS, you know? Yeah. And so we're skeptical. And so when I hear somebody coming with stuff, we follow the skepticism of, oh, yeah, sure. And you should. Yeah. yeah. You and, should. But, but what, I can, what I can say for me, as far as my uh, background, when I look at your research, to me, it's like, wow, this is legit. This is not, yeah. this is not some Yahoo from America coming over here with some interesting idea. Yeah. Man, this really looks legit. Yeah, and I put it together in an in in investigative format. I, I was a taught investigative report writing at the uh, small college in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I put it together in a format that would convince a jury, convince a district attorney right. to, uh, we need to arrest this guy right. because look at what I've got. Like we well, were talking earlier, you can't just have some of the evidence, you have to have it all. Yeah. You can't just throw a guy in jail for... Yeah, and that was my nightmare. Because he had a hunch or a gut feeling. I didn't. I never wanted to have someone arrested that didn't do the crime. I, that would have been a nightmare. Sure. I would have felt horrible the rest of my life. So I was very careful about that. And I honestly, I tried to prove them innocent. Yeah. Well, this is this place is guilty of holding <laughs> the treasures of Israel, and yeah. I believe that with all my heart. Awesome. Now, let's get into the data here, okay? So you started to go research, and you found the steps, and then you moved on, and so on and so forth. Yeah. But overall, you end up with a very interesting pattern that points yes. towards Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, can you explain to the audience here how that's significant and how the data basically showed you something that's beyond the fact that there's treasure yeah. uh, hidden in Qumran? Which, which to which me is, also very is important. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's very important because uh, by doing that and, and, and having a map of Qumran, uh, even today it's still in the same uh, layout. Mm -hmm. uh, if you took a blueprint of Qumran, it's still in the same as well as 2,500, 400, 600 years ago. Not, not much has changed. Has Nothing has changed, <laughs> except where it's a lot smaller. It used to be, you know... <laughs> Some really of those who come from those small towns where they say nothing's changed. Yeah. They hadn't grown a bit. Not much in 40 years. Well, that's Qumran. Yeah. So what I, here's what happened. I was actually looking for a map of Jerusalem at the time of uh, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I was going through there, and I, and I found one. And I, I, didn't, I didn't know it. When I looked at it, I thought, why did they do that? I said, maps are always oriented top to the north. Right. Okay? Right. Well, Qumran was upside down. And I thought, why did they draw Qumran upside down? This is incredibly unprofessional for one thing. <laughs> and I, I thought, oh my gosh. And I got out a map of Qumran and a map of Jerusalem at that time. I printed it off and I got them side by side and I rotated Qumran 180 degrees. They were identical. And I thought, oh my goodness. So, so the layout of the city of Jerusalem yeah at the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah matches the layout 
of Qumran, Qumran community. Two guys, yeah. One, one to one. One to one. Well, they, it, of Very course, close. yeah. I mean, I've seen it. It's, you can't say, you know, if you're going to put them on top of each other, it's not. Uh, I, yeah, no, but but it's, it's very obvious that they're, yeah. one is copying the other. Exactly. <laughs> Not only that, here's the deal. As I was finding all these locations, the, the, the Copper Scroll names the locations. Mm -hmm. And it's like a legend for a map. Uh, it tells you where all these locations at Qumran are at now. Mm -hmm. Even the scriptorium. It names the script the scriptorium where they 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 describe it in exactly the same place. Mm -hmm. The whoever wrote As the it would be in Jerusalem. Yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, no, in that I can't I can't say that. Okay. But the exterior points, for example, the, the fountain and the fountain gate at uh, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the uh, the double mikvah entry mikvah at uh, Qumran is where the double entry mikvah is at for the Pool of Siloam. Mm -hmm. The water system matches Qumran's water system. The trough that runs through Qumran matches the water system and goes up to the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. Everything matches. Mm -hmm. Where the Temple, where this is the important part, mm -hmm. where the Temple, where, or the Teacher of Righteousness, the uh, Zadok, mm -hmm. the Righteous One, his room is where the, the uh, Temple would be located in Qumran, um, as a, as their symbol of the temple right. is the exactly the representation matches Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, not down the city of David where the sewer line was at. I'm surprised to hear that. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> because I, I, I've been I've been receiving so much Lord. overwhelming evidence to prove otherwise. But anyhow, <laughs> may, maybe the guys in Qumran got it wrong. That's what they, must yeah, have been. Two thousand years ago, they thought, you know, let's put it down here. But <laughs> so here's what happened. Because it gives you all this information, even the tower that's there, mm -hmm. it's where the towers were at in Jerusalem at the time of King, da uh, King David and Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So now we got we got a perfect match, mm -hmm. amazing match. So why would they replicate? The, and that's the now this is the real question because let's go back to the time of Qumran where there was no nonsensical controversy as to the location of the temple in the city of David, whatever that did not exist. Mm -hmm. What, why did they do that? What mattered to them? They wanted to... Because that's always the important thing. You want to put yourself in the time of, yeah. and in the f shoes of those people. In the mindset. In the mindset. Say, why would you do this? Yeah. this? You know, I find that extremely bizarre because I can tell you from... I don't know everything in Israel, but I've seen a lot of the archaeology mm -hmm. from north to south. Mm -hmm. I have not come across anything that matches this type of description as Qumran as far as it mimicking Jerusalem, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I, I believe you can read their documents, especially mm -hmm. the community rule. Mm -hmm. uh, they talk about it and how holy, and uh, Joe Good was talking to me about this. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, telling me, he said, Jim, I, th I think there's something very significant with that. He said, there's a place in scripture that talks about the, the, the holy place. Mm -hmm. And he says, it's in the same area where Qumran is at. Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't get to talk, the go into this. Place. Yeah, it's a holy spot, holy location. Okay. And we didn't get to go into a lot of uh, explanation because we're getting ready to come over here. Mm -hmm. So I think what it is that they were trying to uh, mimic or uh, Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, and I'm just guessing on this, mm -hmm. the reason they turned it upside down is because anything that's holy, uh, the ho most holy place is, of course, the Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't want, they don't want to, it's like the... Um, uh, the incense. It's forbidden for anyone to try to make the right. incense with the proper ingredients. It's forbidden. So they made like a copy, but not exactly. But not exactly. <laughs> yeah, they rotated yeah. it. Now, right. they also thought of themselves as uh, the community. The people were the community. They were uh, like a living Jerusalem. And so you would, I guess you could put it this way. They're like the guardians yes. of what's right. Yeah. Because I would say if you look at Jerusalem at the time, mm -hmm. you have a lot of corruption. You have a, a lot, lot of corruption. You have the priests who are not real priests. They're mm -hmm. buying into the priesthood, etc. Yep. And so I would guess people like uh, John the Baptist, mm -hmm. who himself is a, a priest. Yeah, he's you know, close. they they basically leave Jerusalem. They go into the wilderness and basically turn their back on all the corruption of the city, so to speak. Yeah and kind of try to find something, try to find their place, right? I imagine, because now you're disconnected from all of mm -hmm. what's important. 
Yeah. But you're disconnecting yourself because it got that bad. It was, you're, yeah. you're dead on. Because yeah. it's kind of like uh, we were talking before we came on here that that the uh, Jerusalem and Qumran, the, the prophets, that's why I said that this is the home of the prophets. Because yeah. where did the, uh, John the Baptist come out of? He came out of the wilderness. He's pounding on the table mm -hmm. saying, mm -mm, nope, this is all wrong. Correct. Make straight, get ready, prepare. Well, that's what they say in the scrolls, mm -hmm. that they are there to make straight the way of the Lord. They're to prepare. And that's, that's what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, that's what they were doing out in the wilderness. We shall make straight the way of the Lord and prepare a place for him. Mm -hmm. So here you go. Right. That's, that's why I said it earlier that this is the home of the prophets. Mm -hmm. This is where they would come in. They were like the golden rule. You know, they bring the ruler in there and they set it down mm -hmm. by the rulers and theirs was way askew. <laughs> and they said, guys, this is not going to get it. Mm -hmm. and you either get this straightened out or you're going to go into exile for 70 years. They went into exile for 70 years during the time of Jeremiah. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they weren't keeping the Shemitah years. Correct. If they were going to get punished for it and they punished them and their yeah. punishment was exact, not right. one day off, not one week off. It was right. perfect right. from the time that they first went into exile. 70 years. Well, that's what the guys at Qumran were waiting for. And they even left on the copper scroll. It says that this ditch, and I didn't show you this earlier, there was a ditch uh, 60 cubits long. Mm -hmm. It was set for the appointed, at the appointed time. Well, when they came back out of, uh, out of Babylon, it was the appointed time was then. They were supposed to rebuild the temple, but what did they build? They built Zerubbabel's temple, which is a pathetic little match mm -hmm. uh, of what used to be. And I think what they did is they took a portion of that silver and they used it to build the temple. The exile was up. Seventy years were over. So that what they had to do was they had to rebuild uh, and they needed funds. They needed funds for material. They needed funds for labor. And I think that's where that money came from. And if you'll remember in the book of Haggai and the book of Zechariah, what are they doing? They're telling everybody, quit world, uh, living in your paneled houses to get out there and get this building built. Get the temple rebuilt. Well, they they did, but it was pretty pathetic compared half to yeah, half-hearted. <laughs> and and uh, Haggai says, you know, in there, scripture says, the gold is mine, the silver is mine. Thus saith the Lord. And I think what he's telling them was, I know what that's at because Haggai and Zechariah were the two guys, one of two or uh, two of five men that wrote the copper scroll. Hmm. Though they knew where this stuff was at. I mean, if they were there and they actually were the ones that. Their handwriting is on the Copper Scroll. When you look at that, you're seeing the handwriting of Zechariah and Haggai. Mm -hmm. So they took this material, this gold and, or the silver that was there, and that's what they used, I, I believe, to rebuild Zerubbabel's temple. But again, it was pathetic. Mm -hmm. Right. Because I think, like the time we're in right now, mm -hmm. there's this, uh, um, I would say, there needs to be a, a, a consciousness, a temple consciousness. Mm -hmm where we understand the importance. Mm -hmm. See, today, for example, instead of the uh, sacrifices at the temple and so on in the, in the temple worship, we have the Sidul, we have the prayer books. Mm -hmm. And we read the prayers in the morning, afternoon, evening to replicate or to uh, uh, instead of mm -hmm. the service at the temple. And it's also actually a means, it was originally in place as a means to have as a temporary uh, uh, order so that when the temple is back in business, so to speak, back in, in, in operating, then you're not completely at a loss as to what you're supposed to be doing there, mm -hmm. what prayers we're supposed to be praying, and so on. And so I think, like, with that time, they just did not have that, that, that full understanding and, and consciousness for the temple. Therefore, it's a half-hearted uh, effort. And really, we're in the same situation today. Yeah. We received the temple in 1967. God liberated the city of Jerusalem from the occupiers from Jordan. He gave us all of the holy sites, uh, uh, the tomb of, of, of the patriarchs, the Rachel's tomb, uh, the tomb of Joseph, mm -hmm. the Temple Mount. Yet, if you look at it today, these are the most contested areas. We've had, we've had lots of bloodshed over mm -hmm. these areas throughout uh, since 1967. We, we, we're not there yet, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. And I think that's very important is we need to have a temple consciousness. We need to understand the importance so that we can actually finish the job and do it right this time.
Yeah, and if you, and if you look at the time frames, yeah. you're talking 70 years. They've been in Babylon 70 years. How long has it been now since Israel became a nation again? 70, 70 plus now. Yeah, mm -hmm. 70 maybe plus or minus what? Month? 71, <laughs> actually, to be exact. Yeah, so now mm -hmm. the, it's like the exile's over. Mm -hmm. And even, even, let me give you an example. 1947, Israel became a, a country again. Well, 20 years later, it goes to war, 67. It goes to war. How old is a young man when he's old enough to go to war? 20. 20 years old. I don't think that's a, an accident. And this 70-year time frame is happening now. I don't think it's an accident. Sure. It's almost like he's saying, okay, you did your time. You didn't, you didn't take care of things like you're supposed to <laughs> in you know, Babylonian time frame. Well, now, 70 years later, mm. you better get ready because things are coming. And you, you yeah. better not build a little simple Zerubbabel temple this time. You better build a real temple. Right. <laughs> and I think that's what's about to happen yeah. is we're going to see it. Things are coming together. Uh, I don't know how in the world it's going to happen. It's going to be a miracle. Mm. And the biggest thing that we got to deal with uh, for building the temple is doing something about the Jerusalem traffic. It's murder out there. <laughs> it's a nightmare. It's part of the process. And you know what? That's funny that you brought that up because the minister of transportation, who happens to be a Kohen, mm -hmm. he himself wants to help solve one of those main issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of his uh, plan is actually to, to uh, get a better transportation to the Temple Mount. Sure. So this is in the you planning. Need it. Yeah. yeah. And so this is in the planning, and that's now. This is That's just awesome. recent. Yeah. Also what's recent, I mean, talking about time frames and everything and, and, and significant signs, because I think we need to be aware of the signs that we're seeing and seeing how basically God's pushing us and saying, come on, guys, you know, get on with it. You know, you have uh, the president of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, yeah. who I'm telling you out of the 71 years of, of uh, uh, the rebirth of the state of Israel, mm -hmm. We have never had a relationship with a president of any country in the world like we have now with the president of the United States right. uh, and, and labeling him, literally labeling him. And these are talking about Orthodox Jews, rabbis, yeah. labeling him the King Cyrus of today. Yeah. Which, what did King Cyrus do? He helped build, rebuild everything he, yeah. and he helped get the temple going again. Helped fund it, etc. Is, is this, you know, just happens to be? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, you have the Mahona Mishkan, who um, it's one of the temple uh, organizations, who even coined, exactly. not coined, they minted a coin yeah. with the Cyrus and, and Trump there and all that. Yeah. Now, not a lot of people get all up in arms, especially in the U.S., about their dislike of Trump and all that kind of thing. I'm putting that aside. That's irrelevant because Cyrus wasn't, it had nothing to do with his character, it had nothing to do with him being a god fear yeah. at all. Nothing. He worshiped his gods, the guy's a pagan. But the fact is, it's he this does. guy that he God does. uses, and what does he say? The God of heaven spoke to me and all this stuff, and he told me, and you know, and he's just doing the bidding of God, mm -hmm. right? But not saying, well, I pledge allegiance to or anything like that. And so I'm just saying, that's what's significant. I think we need to notice that, and we need to put aside all these other things that we get distracted with, oh, it's Democrat, Republican, it's this, it's that, it's yes. good or bad. Look at what Israel is saying. Exactly. And to me, Israel is the time clock, the prophetic time clock. Mm -hmm. And if Israel's responding like that, to me, that's significant. It's not small beans. You know what? I did an interview uh, about two months ago, and it was with a um, uh, congressman. And he was talking to me about it, and he fell in love with it. Immediately, he saw the importance of it. He saw that, and he's a strong believer. And he said, "He said, can you stay on, stay on the line after we go off the air?" And I said, "Yeah, it's not a problem." He was in Washington State. We go off the air. He gets on. And he said, "Listen," he said, "I can pull in some of my markers, some of my buddies in Washington D.C." He said, "If I could get us an audience with uh, Vice President Pence, would you do it? And would you show him the research?" I said, "Yeah, I'd love to." Sure. He said, because if we can get Trump involved in this, and I said, well, listen, you talk to Trump, you tell him. If he's Cyrus, then he needs to help us get the temple built, too. Absolutely. He's doing great, but don't stop. You let's don't take stop it. with the embassy because that's, that's right. small beans. And it's very small beans. Let's go. Let's take it to the full extent. And I think yeah. he would do it with the proper motivation. Absolutely. I think he I would think do so it. I think so as well. 
that's part of what we're doing with Cry for Zion because I believe that we've kind of come to this point where with the previous president, I knew there's, there's just, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to convince this guy of anything. Yeah. But if there's anybody that I feel that's a world leader that can be convinced to do anything significant concerning the Temple Mount, concerning more than just moving the embassy, mm -hmm. it would be the president sitting today, the, uh, Donald Trump, with, with, by the way, this is also important, is with your, 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 your representative here, the, the ambassador, which uh, David Friedman, I can tell you, is definitely, definitely a very God-fearing Jew who, in my opinion, would do the right thing. Mm -hmm. if, if he had the backing of, of the United States, he wouldn't be the one to say, well, I think the geopolitical situation is blah, blah, blah. He'd just say, absolutely. I'll help you get it done. I'll call all, all who needs to get called and, 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 and get it done. So in other words, politically speaking, it couldn't be a better time right now, Perfect. I think. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think the significance would be for the Copper Scroll fines and what could be unearthed there to what we're saying? Well, it's just like what we're talking about with um, the rabbi that saw my research years ago. He said, he said this is the dowry for the coming bride. Well, if, if we can convince these people, and if you, let's, let's, take, let's make one find exactly where it's supposed to be. You better, you better start shutting things down because one find out there at Qumran is going to open a huge can of worms at one, and it's also sure. going to start a revival in Israel like we've never seen, and in the United States. Because if they found the more, more important things that, that potentially are out there, sure. and let's just name it, let's just throw it out there, the Ark of the Covenant. If it were there, mm -hmm. can you imagine what that would do to Christianity and to Judaism? Mm -hmm. They would be, everybody would like that. It's no longer a fable, it's reality. It's reality and so it's, it's something true. significant that they can actually, can't touch it, but it's significant where you got it, you've got it in the background there and they say, it's real. Mm -hmm. And all the ones that have been on the fence all these years are going to get off the fence. Right. All the ones that are, you know, Satanists are going to go, hey, man, okay, maybe <laughs> I better get on the other side. It's, <laughs> things are going to change. <laughs> things are going to change. It's going to be a whole new ball game at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be like 9-11. Everything's going to shut down. People are going to fill the synagogues. They're going to fill the churches and everybody. And they better take that time in history. Mm -hmm. to make a real strong devotion and decision to serve the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Mm -hmm. you got to serve them, and you got to do what's right, and you got to do for your family. Mm -hmm. And let's rebuild our families and make them what they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is for me, personally. Mm -hmm. I don't give a darn about the money. I don't give a darn about the gold and silver. It, that's kosher metal to build things with. Right. That's it. Right. It's not about how rich you are. Mm -hmm. It's about being as dads became and dads again and moms holding things together and being like a family because that's what God teaches us is you're my bride. Mm. Be a good bride. Be a good mom. I'm the dad and he's the example that we should all be following. All of us. And I think that's what this is, what's coming because I'm not doing this copper scroll thing for the gold. I don't give a darn about that. What I'm doing it for is my grandkids and my grandkids' grandkids. And we could go into a millennial kingdom, a time when it's real, and we've got a righteous king over all of us sure. that's making decisions like it's supposed to be. Absolutely. So that's you know, where, personally, that's where I feel. I think that's significant because based on what you're saying there and the fact that it's Hanukkah season now. Yes. Um, literally last night was the first night of Hanukkah for us here now as of this recording, um, which again, that's part of the convention that we're all about. Um, we've chosen the season, the time, specifically because our battle, our struggle is not for what can I get out of it, mm -hmm. but it's, it's for the sanctity of the name of God. Mm -hmm. And that's, the, that's really the struggle that the Maccabees fought. They didn't do it for the gold and the treasure that they were trying to redeem from the, the Greeks, you know. Mm -hmm. No, it was the name of God, the Torah of Israel. If you just hear uh, uh, Yudah Maccabi and in his, mm -hmm. his uh, um, speech to his men, he basically says, listen, it is better for me and for us to die fighting for the Torah, mm -hmm. for Israel, for our countrymen, than to allow them to basically uh, do as they wish and, and, to, and to defile the name of God mm -hmm. and so on. So in other words, it was a righteous struggle. It was for Torah. It was for truth. It was for Israel. It was for God. Mm -hmm. It wasn't for their own benefit. 
And it was through that struggle that we ended up actually with, I think it was about 200 years of not having a foreign entity telling Israel that they can't study God's Torah, mm -hmm. we can't keep his covenants, and be who we are supposed to be, which is a nation of, of priests and a light to the nations besides to ourselves. Well, that's, that's one of the things that's going to be come to light. Watch. I'm not going to tell you the details, but it's going to come to light and it's going to come from Qumran. The teachings at Qumran is, is you know, Israel is supposed to be a nation of priests, mm -hmm. which means all of the tribes of Israel are to perform and, and be like the Kohanim that are, exist even better than the mm -hmm. Kohanim that exist today. Mm -hmm. It will lock everything together. So keep that in the back of your mind because Qumran is going to provide information, hidden information, that is going to enlighten us in a major way because we've got to rebuild and rebuild the, the, the priesthood. Uh, and I'm certainly not one of them. But even if you consider me a goy, mm -hmm. the, the rabbi said that it's a goy or a ger, and I am ger, that, mm -hmm. found, that is to find and help lead the, the nation of Israel to the, the temple treasures. Mm -hmm. That's the strangest thing. Mm -hmm. And I still I had rabbis tell me that, and I'm thinking, well, show me. Don't just tell me. <laughs> show me where it's at in script. Show me exactly. where it's at in Torah. Show me where it's in Talmud. <laughs> Show yeah, me, yeah. but they haven't been able to show me that. Uh -huh. So I'll just be happy to be, you know, Jimmy the fireman from Oklahoma that did it. If that happened, my reward is set. Mm. And I want to go home after this is over and get back to my Bible study instead of <laughs> battling, because there's a lot of battles that for come sure, with us. For sure. Well, Mr. Barfield, I really appreciate this interview. I really appreciate um, the, 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 the fight that you have taken mm -hmm. for, for the nation of Israel because. That's our passion. That's our goal, mm -hmm. uh, is to help kindle and, and, and get that spark amongst the God-fearing uh, Gentiles in the nations to, to take action, not just to be on the, on the cheerleading side, but to push us, push the nation of Israel into the place that we need to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I know from my history that I've studied that the nation of Israel is reborn to the gratitude of the Christian Zionists who actually gave birth and, and helped support the, the uh, Jewish Zionist movement, which led to the rebirth of the nation of Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a Christian Zionist that it actually was the one that established the, the defense force for Israel. Mm -hmm. And so these are two very important key entities that brought us to where we're at today, 71 years later. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's Christian Zionists like yourself that will help bring us to the next stage and to hopefully also get us to be restored to our holy mountain here in Jerusalem. My job, I've got to convince the Israelis to finish what we started in 2009. And I'm here, guys, and I will help all I can. Well, by God's grace, you'll be successful and we'll be 100% uh, supportive of that cause. So again, thank you very much for this interview. This was awesome. And I really believe that a lot of the people uh, watching are going to be uh, very impacted and uh, filled with a lot of good information. Well, thank you for the opportunity to tell more people. Love it. Shalom. Thank you. Shalom. Thanks for watching the video. To keep this content free, please consider making a donation at cryforzion.com. Thank you.